I've spoke at these conferences many years in a row, past, I don't know, maybe decade or so. And if you guys know me, I typically talk about tape, tape repositories, long-term tape. And today, something new. Um, we're going to be discussing uh, how disks are being leveraged in long, large-scale, long-term storage, long-term repositories. So the first speaker that I have today is Kirill Malkin. He's with SGI, uh, and the, he's going to talk about uh, the impact of power management on these hard drives and, and a, about a product that the company acquired and what they're learning from having this thing in the field for these past many years. Kirill? Thank you, Jim. All right, so um, my name is Kirill Malkin. Um, I'm currently in the role of Director of Engineering for Storage um, at SGI. I joined the company a little over two years ago as part of one of the uh, acquisitions. Um, and I'm going to talk in this, in this particular um, presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, not, so much, not so much about the future, but about the past, right? So that's in contrast of what we discussed earlier. So this is a look in the past. Sometimes it's helpful to uh, see how things went, to uh, see how they might go uh, in the future. So in this particular case, we're talking about um, what happens when we power down the disks. And what I guess what the uh, organizers wanted to focus on is not so much a speculation of what could happen, why is it good or why is it bad, but just on the hard question of whether you know it really helps anything to uh, power down the disks so um, let's talk a little bit about the benefits you know potential benefits of why would we ever want to power down the hard disk drives well for one thing you know um, powering down the drives might extend the drives life well take extreme example right so if I you know, bought a drive and stored it for five years, and then I plugged it in and ran for another five years, which is the, or three years, whatever the warranty period might be, then I just extended my lifespan, you know, just doubled my lifespan, essentially, of the, of the drive, right? Well, the question is, will this hold if we do this more frequently? What if we did this every, you know, week? What if we did it every day? What if we did it every time we needed the access to the data? And then we would spin them down, either immediately after or after some period of time. Will that actually help extend the drive's life, or would it be the opposite, or would it be a, a wash? So, so that's uh, that's one uh, kind of a reason for turning off the power. The other reason would be to dial in power consumption, and kind of say, well, right now I want to run at a certain uh, power level, you know, I want to run my data center at a certain power level, and hard disks are, of course, big consumers of power. So what if I wanted to set the exact power at which I want to run uh, based on my budget, and just which will result in powering down, you know, some of the hard drives. So keeping that in mind, you know, um, the um, there was a company uh, that, that was founded in um, early 2000s that came up with uh, a new uh, moniker for, for this type of technology, power managed disks or MAID. So essentially it's a um, managed array of um, independent or inexpensive, however you like it, uh, drives where you could have a, a large, not just a few drives, but a large number of drives being powered off. Um, you know, at least 50% of the drives being powered off. And you could power cycle them by policy based on access or based on some other uh, necessity. And that essentially uh, would uh, bring one of the benefits that, that we discussed earlier, um, extending the drive life uh, cycle and uh, managing the power. So um, the company was called Copan Systems, and they actually came up with Enhanced Maid. Uh, and they've um, came up with um, um, an idea that only a maximum of 25% of the drives would be spinning at any given point in time, which is a quarter of the drives, obviously. Um, and they've come up with uh, two uh, 
types, you know, kind of two layers of software. One was called power managed RAID software, which essentially um, provided additional redundancy, actually extended redundancy um, over the um, uh, disks that were power managed. And another one, uh, another set of software was called disk aerobics. And what disk aerobics was doing uh, was essentially, you know, further improving disk resiliency uh, and validating data integrity at, at certain periods. So I'm not going to go into details about that, but I'm just going to mentioned that uh, power managed RAID's uh, function um, was basically to spin the drives only when necessary to meet the application demand. And that is basically when the application wanted to access something. Um, and as a result, this was supposed to extend the drive life by more than four times. And the disk aerobics uh, software did some nice tricks to um, actually proactively uh, monitor and manage the device health. Um, early uh, kind of a report on issues that, that might have been happening with, uh, with the specific disk drives through uh, collection of smart attributes or through collection of, uh, you know, through detection of what I would call slow I.O. Uh, when it takes a while for disk to recover the data, uh, you know, maybe multiple retries, which is an early indicator that something is not right with, with the device. Um, and also doing things like scrubbing, uh, where we would validate the consistency and readability of all the sectors and try to recover them as we do that, um, as well as periodically exercise the drives. Because, you know, what if we, you know, run the drive for a while, then we, we stop it for a very long time. Wouldn't it be nice to periodically exercise it and run a self-test on it? And finally, and probably more importantly, is proactive failing of suspect drives. So rather than waiting before the drive hard fails or doesn't spin up again, uh, if there is early indication that, that the drive might be uh, suspect, uh, let's just evacuate the data from it and replace it before it actually fails um, you know, inside, inside the system, co uh, causing a, um, data unavailability. So, uh, just to give you a brief history of Copan. Copan was started in 2003. Um, it, the first product, Revolution 200 series, was shipped in 2004. Um, and it supported uh, two types of access style. It was made LUNs. It's just basically disk traditional SCSI LUNs. And virtual tape library, where, where this construct was presented as a, as a tape, uh, you know, virtual tape device. It was based on um, intellect scale controller. Um, and um, later model, uh, which included performance upgrades, in, resulted in delivery of 300, you know, Series 300 that was delivered in 2008. And then additional redesign uh, was resulted in the release of 400 series uh, in 2009. Uh, the um, redesign mostly um, was focused on the controller, so it was a new Com Express controller that was installed, as well as new disk canisters and backplane were significantly improved because a lot of um, apparently there were some issues with signal integrity that 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 needed to uh, to be taken care of. Um, Eventually, uh, Copan was acquired by SGI around 2010, and they've been shipping 400 series until about 2014. So that's just a brief history. Now, uh, what was the promise as it relates to drive life and reliability? Because that's what we're focusing on in this, in this talk. So you can see the table on the right uh, that kind of has, um, you know, uh, two main columns. So one is uh, mean time between failures and hours, and another column is the um, annual failure rate uh, in terms of percentages. So uh, you can see that um, the um, SATA disks, at least at that time, Right, and that's that's circa uh, 2006, I think the table is. I mean, I picked it up from uh, a presentation by uh, by Copan. Um, shows about 1.4 percent annual failure rate, which translates in about 600,000 hours of mean time between failure. That's a relatively low characteristic, and it was not unusual at that time for archive type of drives. Um, right now, majority of the drives are supporting about 0.73% annual failure rate, uh, which is closer to 
um, let's say, um, uh, a little over a million um, uh, hours of mean time between failure. And you can see that, uh, that for example, uh, 600,000 hours is about 68 years of mean time between failure for a single device. And if you multiply that by the number of devices in the system, let's say a thousand, then of course you can calculate how many failures a year you will you will incur. Now the fiber channel uh, drives and SAS drives were traditionally more reliable, uh, and you can see that that even at that time they were around 0.73 or you know close to uh, close to one percent. Uh, of, of reliability, uh, and it, yeah, they were considered more uh, more dependable. So, based on the, on powering down uh, the drives, the drive life and reliability promise was to extend that by uh, a factor of four. So that that was the expectation essentially. What that translates in terms of number of failures a year of one thousand drives? Well. With SATA drives, traditional SATA drives, you will see 15 failures per year on 1,000 drives. And with Copan, it was only three, three failures a year. And that was better than SATA. That was better than Fiber Channel. That was a pretty good number, uh, which was around 0.3 and the change percent. And that was you know, equivalent to about 2.9 uh, million, uh, million hours for a single drive. So there was a, um, a graph, again, this, is, this, is, this goes back to uh, 2006 data, that suggested four times improvement uh, basically on, um, uh, on, on, on the data, which was actually picked up from reliability field data. So between 2004 and 2006, there was active, active collection of data uh, in the field, and you can see the white line, which is kind of flooding out, that's the 600,000 hour MTBF. Now, the blue line is what shows the observed MTBF. Now, this is an interesting, it's kind of, it's a, bit, a little bit of a marketing um, uh, ingenuity that is put into the slide because it shows like that, that it kind of climb, climbs up nicely. Uh, but really what, what it is, is, is when you uh, install more and more systems in the field, you basically measure how frequently they fail. And if they fail less often than, than you would expect, like 600,000 uh, uh, hours MTBF, then that line will event inevitably go up. Now you see periodically there's drops and that means that something has failed so we're back to uh, you know slightly worse scenario but overall we're we're progressively getting better as we install more systems and they fail less frequently. So that's how I would interpret this this slide. Now the big question is did this promise hold up? And to answer that we needed to uh, do some failure analysis. Um, so the goal was to essentially determine observed AFR, because that's, that's what this is all about. So how frequently the drives were actually failing uh, on a year-per-year -year basis. And for that, ideally, what I'd love to have was to um, have a number of disks under support, right, in the current, during a certain period of time, and a number of disks replaced. Now, uh, it turned out that, that it's relatively hard to get that data when it's when it's in the past and especially uh, when the company is going through um, an acquisition. So the detailed data was really difficult to, uh, to, to get a hold of and instead I had to rely on some indirect and complete data which proved to be an interesting exercise in statistical forensics. So um, one thing that, that, that I you know, kind of tried to approach it many different ways, you know, what do you do? You just can't get that data, I mean, right? So, and and um, I kind of promised to get, <laughs> give that talk, so, so I had to get a little more inventive around it. So I um, decided to first organize the data by disk capacity uh, to enable validation checkpoints. So I could validate that what I'm doing is actually making sense. Because if I just lumped everything into one big pile of disks and try to calculate AFR, you know, who knows if I'm right or wrong? I mean, it could be in either way. And this actually proved to be quite useful, which I'm gonna cover in a second. So the data that I actually was able to, um, to get a hold of uh, was mostly post-2010 um, field replacement unit, unit codes and the matching system data. 
I mean, that's what I just was able to get. Um, so um, it had the part number. It indicated whether this was a Copan part number or SGI part number. How many disks was replaced? Uh, in how many shelves? You know, because the disks were coming in shelves. The, each shelf contained 112 uh, uh, disks. And there were systems that, that could have as little as just one shelf, but typical system size was six shelves or eight shelves. Um, and um, another interesting characteristic that I had was the year first replaced. So, uh, for example, I could you know, have that FRU number, the number of um, uh, disks replaced, and, and just one figure for, uh, for a year. Um, what that means is that, that this was the earliest time that this FRU was replaced. And uh, what I had to do is I kind of have to assume uh, that, that there's even failure distribution after the year first replaced. Uh, which is a pretty good approximation in that case. And unfortunately, pre-acquisition service data was not available at all. Um, so I had to resort then to analyzing post-2010 data, including both existing installations that were transferred you know, and taken over by uh, SGI support contracts, as well as new installations that SGI had sold and shipped um, you know, um, post-2010. So one of the things that I needed to do is to determine overall disk count. So I had the, the uh, number of failed disks, right? But now I had to also determine overall disk count that, so that I could match it against uh, the failed uh, disks. So the way I did that is I obtained as a separate, completely separate, not support, because uh, support doesn't know how many was shipped, right? But um, uh, you know, I was able to obtain post-2010 sales data, which nicely correlated with the support data. In other words, sales by SGI. And then I had to extrapolate the system count so, sold by Copan based on the number of installations that, that, that went under support contract. So, you know, without boring you with too many uh, details of that, you know, I just want to give you a summary. So the total storage analyzed included 34,200 disk devices. And that's a good size sample for that type of analysis, you know, so I was pretty happy about that. Um, I um, was able to identify eight different disk capacities. There were a couple, a couple more, but those were the most prevalent that I was able to find. And this was a, almost 32 petabytes of total capacity across these different, different disks. Now, I decided to not worry about post-failure analysis because that data was frankly not available. So I consider that if the disk was replaced, then it must have failed, right? So um, it probably is a little conservative, but nonetheless is a reasonable approximation. And also there was no consideration for non-disk related failures. In other words, if there's backplane issues that, that caused the, the, um, uh, you know, a, a replacement or something like that, I did not consider that. So what did I come to? Um, essentially, um, this is the graph that represents um, made shelves analyzed. I mean, the, the y-axis is essentially number of shelves, and the x-axis is capacity. I don't know if you can see, I, I guess you can. So, uh, so the um, capacities were from uh, anywhere from 73 gigabytes, and that was a SAS drive, uh, 250 gigabytes, 500 gigabytes, 70, 750 gigabytes, one, two, three, and four terabytes. And it's what's what's interesting about it is that the color co coding here is, is who shipped the drive. So obviously lower capacities were shipped earlier. So so those were shipped by Copan, and eventually they were subsumed by things that were shipped by uh, by SGI. And interestingly enough, there was a lot more disks shipped by Copan simply because it's just they there was just more disks needed to reach a certain capacity. So, and this is what uh, the, 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 the juicy part is. I mean, this is essentially unscrubbed failure data. So I, you know, in, presented in the exact same way. Uh, so based on actual annual failures. Um, and uh, you can see that, that there was at least one clear outlier there. So I kind of looked into it a little deeper, and I found that there was just a massive disk replacement that was likely caused by a problem with the batch. And this is where you know my kind of a separation or, or segregation of this by uh, by disk capacity really helped, because I was able to find that particular outlier that otherwise would have screwed up my uh, my entire analysis. So when I scrubbed the data, this is what it looked like, um, and this is a kind of a nice chart that's showing. I mean, uh, there's there's a lot less failures on the 73 gigabyte part, I guess because there was just not, not, not many of them out there, but all the others kind of uh, uh, nicely uh, were following the shipped 
quantities. So what I did is I ultimately related one to another, and that's when I came up with this observed annual failure rate, which is you know uh, the, the two curves. So the again the, the blue curve is the is the curve shipped by uh, by Copan uh, failure rates uh, of of device shipped by Copan, and the orange one is the one shipped by SGI, and you can see that um, you know when I um, and the gray line is actually the average between the two. Right? So you can see how the line is kind of, and the dotted line is obviously the trend. So you can see how it um, actually progresses, uh, kind of slightly climbs up. But what's interesting that it stays uh, below, you know, most of the time it stays around 0.4 to 0.6 percent. So the answer to the question that was asked, you know, originally is yes. Spinning disks down appears to improve annual failure rate compared to the manufacturers, um, uh, and it, in other words, it's extending drives life. So Copan reported four times or better. The manufacturer AFRs, which improved over uh, over the years, are anywhere between 0.73 to 1.4 percent, but the observed AFR is 0.3 to 0.6 percent, and that is conservative. Remember, we didn't analyze any reasons for uh, you know uh, for replacement of the disks, and we always considered that that if the disk had been replaced, it must have failed. And another interesting trend that I found is that AFR, observed AFR, tends to increase with the disk capacity, which is probably not a surprise because you know the, the density gets uh, gets higher and the chances for failure are you know um, probably there's more chance for for failure. So I can say uh, with with confidence that the observed improvement is about 2.x. My gut feeling it's probably better than that, but the fact that it's at least 2.x already gives me. Uh, you know, kind of the uh, reasons say yes. We uh, it, it does help to uh, uh, the spinning discs down does help to extend drives life. So what I'd like to touch upon next is where uh, you know where do we take this um, uh, technology beyond Copan? And um, uh, we've been working on high performance and cost optimized storage for um, obviously we're an HPC market, so so we're focusing on HPC. Uh, our data management platform for HPC is called D DMF. This is a technology that's been around for a couple of decades and has close to exabyte under management and. And we, um, you know, Copan was originally thought to become a part of uh, DMF uh, uh, ecosystem or infrastructure as a, as a backend, and we're kind of continuing in that vein. We've uh, reworked some of the intellectual property that was acquired and created, came up with something that is called uh, JBFS or JBOT file system. Now, this is not a real file system. What it is, it's uh, a di on disk format that enables certain capabilities uh, that essentially make disks look like tape, tape drives. Right, so so we essentially write to disks because we we are excelling with DMF at writing to tapes, um, and we figured you know tape is magnetic media, disk is magnetic media. We can just as well write to disk the same way that we're writing to tape. So, and that's what JBFS was, was built upon. But it does leverage significant amount of data management software IP that came with SGI acquisition by Copan. It, it uh, certainly relies on some of the principles that were uh, built into that. Um, and um, what, you know, the specifics of JBFS and the reason for having JBFS is ability to deliver data access and the IO performance significantly beyond the alternatives. And what the alternative might be, well, the alternative might be just a simple RAID, uh, array, or it could be object storage. So with this JBFS for HPC markets fill, fills the actual gap uh, between, uh, say, tape um, and and uh, and object storage, as I can show on this slide. So this is basically the DMF7 Echo system uh, that we currently. Uh, you know, it's kind of a snapshot of the DMF7 ecosystem. And you can see cold storage with SGI is low cost and high performance. What this allows us to do essentially is to significantly improve uh, recall capabilities from tape. Like if we send one copy of data to tape, we send another copy of data to the uh, JBFS, then when we're recalling, we don't have to mount the tape. So the recalls are happening a lot faster. But it, it can do so much more beyond that. First, it can, uh, we can actually power down the drives. So 
we can we can uh, reduce the to total power consumption and uh, extend the life of the uh, disks, but we can also recall and migrate at a very high speed as a result of that. If, if the target of migration is JBFS, because all disks are uh, running in parallel, there is no RAID, um, uh, we're essentially streaming the data to each disk individually. Uh, given current rates, we're actually getting some, some pretty amazing performance. Out of out of like a single JBot, to, you know, to, to give you a number, it's uh, you know this JBot is capable of delivering close to you know just just a pure line speed of about 20 gigabytes a second, and that's just one for you uh, uh, for you system. So there are other things on this uh, uh, diagram that I'm not going to talk about. I just want to mention that that we are working very diligently on evolving our data um, uh, migration facility or DMF, and it's becoming our data management uh, framework. Um, and capable of um, answering some of the questions that were raised today uh, during the data management and workflow discussion, uh, handling hundreds of billions of objects, providing dynamic namespaces, integrating with, with job schedulers and workflows, um, as well as supporting a very important construct which we call tier zero, and essentially what that is is flash inside compute. At that point, I'd like to uh, thank you for listening, and uh, I'm done.